So <clears throat> we had this game of life viewer thing here that um, initialized the world with this with this figure here. And so when we run this, <coughs> when we run this with main, yeah. Then you can see the, the glider here running around the screen and eventually it'll run off the edges, of course. And what I said last Monday, or sometime, uh, maybe even two Mondays ago, that there are other configurations, and one of you actually was very nice to key in one of those more complicated configurations. So let me just show you that in case you haven't done it yourself. I wanted to make sure everyone's seen this. So this other configuration is, as you can see, it's quite a bit more complex. And so uh, the program that, that he created gives us four of them, one on each corner of the screen. And so you see that when they run and following these arcane game rules, they transform themselves and they emit this stream of these gliders that run across the screen. And so he's cleverly positioned them so that those streams then collide with each other in interesting ways. And so you can watch this for hours and see <laughs> what it's doing. <clears throat> and so thanks for, for that work. Um, so if you want to run this yourself, just pick up that, that code from Piazza and drop it in instead of the init that I gave you. And it's a much better advertisement, of course, for, for this thing. So this is Conway's ga Game of Life. It's not a game in, uh, in the usual sense. It's just this, this set of very simple rules that gets out of which this amazing behavior emerges. And so if you think about it, it, it really is pretty amazing. There was like three rules, right? When, uh, when a cell gets born, when it dies, and you could program it you know, fairly quickly or maybe not so quickly judging from some of the comments on, on Piazza. But out of that, you have this you know, really incredibly complex behavior. Um, all right. So I wanted to demo that. Um, any questions already on homework 13, the last and final homework? <coughs> so let me pull it up real quick and see if I wanted to give a couple of hints. No, it's not. So, <clears throat> uh, we're going to be talking about interfaces today. Um, so maybe I should come back to this at the, at the end of the class. Um, and I wanted to put the interface concept to work with, with A and B, uh, really with all of them. Um, so I guess I should just give the lecture and then talk about the homework for, for a few minutes. So, let's do that. But, yeah. Uh, does the interface concept apply to Java or is it to? Oh, no, no. It's, there are many languages that, that have uh, interfaces. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a general uh, kind of a technique. Um, oh, final exam um, before anything else. So I posted this on Piazza, but I wanted to make sure everyone has a chance to see this. So uh, it's December 17th. Um, so it's, it's again on a Monday, but it's 12.15, not 1.30. So if any of you here come in at 1.30, say, oh, I thought it was during regular class time, then someone would have a problem, and that wouldn't be me. So don't do that. Um, so the way I'll design the exam, if I already started doing it, is actually pretty simple. Is you know, I'll be inspired by problems that come from the homeworks, the labs, or uh, those problems that I've been tagging with practice over the last several days. Um, and so if you work through those three sources, that should be more preparation than, than you need. Um, 
I'm saying that because ever so often get, I get students whose, whose plan to study for the final is to reread the book. And while I couldn't agree more with you that it's a wonderful book, uh, I do think that's not a very effective way of preparing for the final. The final is going to probe, can you actually do this stuff? And not, can you read about it? So, uh, and the way to, to practice that is to really do more things. So, what I would really do, start doing is, uh, for practicing the final, is I would go relentlessly through these practice problems. If you can get these done quickly, then that's great. I would go through those homeworks where you did not get a full score. If you got a score of 18, you know, relax and smile. But if you got something that was significantly below that, and was significantly below that, I mean like you know, 14 or below, um, figure out why you didn't get 18, and then just redo them without looking at the solution. I mean, looking at the solution you know, is, is good as a matter of last resort, but it, it doesn't really teach you as much as doing it yourself. And um, also with the labs, you know, if there was a problem that seemed kind of interesting but you ran out of time, um, now is the time to uh, finish those up. And if you do those things, you're going to do well in the final. So the basic themes are, of course, <coughs> um, implementing methods in classes. Remember all those bugs where we went back and forth and de dealt with instance variables and methods that, that uh, transformed them in some way? And so there'll be, there'll be something of that flavor. And quite probably, I'll just take one of the bug examples and modify it in some way so that you don't have to learn uh, grasp a brand new context quickly. Uh, and then there'll be loops, 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 arrays, arrays, arrays. You know, the loops will loop over strings, they'll loop over arrays, more loops over arrays, more loops over strings, and there'll be a bunch of problems that say, just finish this code, just what we had in the, in the midterm, that first problem. There was a question there, yes? Ah, okay, so I will somewhere put a token question where I will use the word interface in some way and it will not be material to the question. It'll be something where it says uh, finish this method and it'll be implementing some interface, maybe measurable or something. The rationale for that is that if I later get asked for whether I put that stuff on the final, I can say, yeah, yeah, sure I did but I don't expect you to become masters of this material. It's kind of put in here at the end of, this, of the first semester so that when you see it again at the beginning of the second semester, that it's not quite so, so new and not quite so surprising. But I'm not really expecting that you spend major time studying it. So with that, I've probably lost all interest in today's lecture. But uh, no, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a concept, as you'll see in just a minute, that's good to have seen more than once before it sinks in. And that was the rationale for spending a week on it now and spending another week on it, or uh, I think a week and a half, at the beginning of 46B. Other questions? All right, so the tutors, bless their heart, are offering a workshop that you can see here. So just go click on it and see what it takes to, to register in. You know, by all means, uh, show up for that. I think it's great that they're doing it. Okay, moving on. So <clears throat> we're going to be talking about this interface type concept. And I have a um, somewhat realistic example to motivate why we would care. So we, in chapter six, there was this data set class. And in chapter six, the data set class was there. It, it, you could add numbers to the data set. And at the end, it would tell you that you had, uh, of the numbers that you put in, the average was some value and the maximum was some value. So it just tracked all of the numbers, added them all up in a sum so that you could later find out what is the, the, the average. And it also kept track of which one was the maximum. And now that was great for numbers. What if I want to have the same service, computing the maximum and the average for objects of some other class. And here as an example, I did it for bank account. Not that I really care about for bank accounts, but it's just a good example of a class, of a simple class, where one can see the mechanics. So in, the, in chapter six, the add method took numbers. I kept on calling add with a number. Add three, add 19, add seven, whatever. Um, here I'm gonna call add with bank account objects. 
And so I need to update the sum of the, and I keep track of the balances. I don't care anything about the bank account except its balance. So here I keep track of the sum. So I add the current balance to the, to the sum. The sum is an instance variable of this class. So it gets bigger and bigger over time. And I also want to keep track of the largest account that I've ever seen. That's kind of a human urge. So I am saying if the largest one I've ever seen before has a lower balance than the, the one that is, uh, was handed to me now, then I'm going to say, oh, now I'm changing my mind. The largest one is the new one. Um, there's a funny case here with account equals zero. If I haven't seen any bank account at all, then this maximum uh, instance variable is null because it hasn't been set to anything yet. And I don't want to call get balance on null because that would give me a null pointer exception. So I'm checking for that. So I'm saying if it's the first one that I've ever seen, well, then it's the largest for sure. I could equally well have checked here if maximum equals null, but that would have been three extra letters. Four extra letters. All right. So <clears throat> um, that's now I've done something that's maybe mildly interesting. I've taken this data set class that worked for numbers. Now I've made it work for bank accounts. Well, what if you want to make it work for a different class? Let's say for coins. So I have some coin class. A coin has a value. It doesn't have a balance. It's a coin, after all. It has a value. And now I want to do the same modification for coins. Can I do it? Sure, I can do it. Instead of bank account, I put coin in here. Instead of calling get balance, I put get value in here and in here, the two places where I need to know what the value of the thing is. Over here, where the maximum used to be a bank account, now I make it into a coin. And it's completely mechanical. It's the same modification again. And if you have to do the same thing over and over again as a software engineer, you don't like that because it's a sign that your job is soon to be outsourced. So there should be a better way of capturing that commonality. So what we're trying to do is to come up with a mechanism where we can write that data set class once and then have it work for coins and bank accounts and you know, whatever people, whatever other kind of things we want to, to keep track of in this way. And where keeping track of means you know, finding out some statistics about the data, the maximum, the uh, the average, that kind of stuff. So we kind of want to see how could we express the commonality between all of these classes in a way that we don't have to write that code over and over again. And so one way of doing that is if we could replace the various method calls here. You see here we have a get value. Previously I had a get balance. If we could replace those with a single method, that would already be a good thing. So here, I'm going to call that method get measure, where the measure is every, every object has to decide how it wishes to be measured. A bank account gets measured by its balance. A, a coin would get me measured by the value, its face value. A person might get measured by their height. So th that's already a good step. So we would now replace these get value, get balance, whatever, with get measure. And then, of course, we have a problem. We have to specify what is the type that goes in here. We want to add things that, that have some general type. And so the way you do that in, in Java, because Java, in Java you always have to specify the types of everything, you invent a new type that solves your problem. And so here I'm calling that type measurable. So I say something is measurable if it has a method called get measure. And so what's uh, funny about this is I'm specifying no implementation. I don't know how that measure is obtained. Um, hold that thought. I'll show you in a minute how that's done. Right now, we're just saying something is measurable if it has a method get measure. And then I can now implement my data set. Here it is. <coughs> so you see each time here, I put in that somewhat obscure measurable type. Over here I call x.getMeasure. And the compiler is happy because it looks at this getMeasure call. It looks to the left. It sees x. It says, what the heck is x? Oh, x is the thing over here. What is its type? It's measurable. And measurable promises to have a getMeasure method. And so the compiler will know that that method will surely exist. 
So such a promise that such a method will surely exist is called an interface type. And so you'll notice that when it's declared in over here, it's not a class. It's declared with the keyword interface. So an interface is a promise that later that class, that some class or more than one class will implement those methods. That's all that it is. And it's already useful by itself because it means that I can write, me, uh, <coughs> I can write functionality such as here this data set class that takes advantage of those interfaces. So I will never have to write data set again uh, for another class. I can just write it once for this interface. Now how do I make it work with a particular class? So I do now have to retrofit my bank account if I want to use it with a data set. I do have to retrofit my coin if I want to use it with a data set. And it's easy enough to do. I take my class here, the bank account, and I now say this bank account promised to implement that interface. So the keyword implements says this class will do whatever it is that measurable wants it to be done, which in our case is a single thing, namely to implement the get measure method. And the bank account implements get measure by returning the balance. It could do something else, but that's what it does. The coin implements measurable just as much, and it returns the value of the coin. Now, just to kick this around a little bit, what if the bank account were to implement measurable and it would not supply this method? What if it just it didn't play by the rules and didn't do this? In that case, the compiler would say, well, wait a minute. You were promising to implement measurable. You didn't implement get measure. That's a syntax error. So let's do another thought experiment. What if the method was instead implemented to return, no, to return zero? Now what would happen is if one were to add a bunch of bank accounts to a data set, the data set would later say, well, the average of all those measures was zero, which isn't surprising since they all reported zero. And it would say the largest that I've ever seen was the first one. So that's not very interesting or very useful, so one should just not do that. All right, so again, why are we doing this? We're doing this so that we can reuse code. And which code can we reuse? It's not the bank account or the coin that we can reuse, it's the data set that we can reuse. So you should, should think of the data set as the, <coughs> uh, this, this mixer here. The, you know, that, that big heavy stand mixer, that's the data set. And what is, the, what is the mixer willing to do, if you think about it? A mixer is there to provide a service, just as the data set is there to provide a service. And what's the service that the mixer provides? No. That is not the service that it provides. What service does the mixer provide? No, no, no. The, the mixer is here. It, it lives to serve. And it provides a very specific service. It spins, it rotates. The service that the mixer provides is not to mix, it's to rotate. They should call it a rotator. Because anything that you plug in that has the right attachment uh, thingy, it will get rotated. It doesn't have to mix, right? You could, for all, if they made such a thing, you could put in a drill and then put in a piece of wood under it and it would work, right? You would turn on your rotator yeah, I don't know why they call it a mixer. And it would start rotating the drill bit and would drill through the piece of wood. Right? KitchenAid does not really care what it is that is being rotated. So the, this, this machine here provides the service of rotation to whatever it is that is willing to conform to the interface. And the interface is that little thing that has this, you know, this, this, this little springy stuff that you can pinch together when, when it gets plugged in. Um, you've all seen that. Um, and actually, I know this f from the other way around. When I was in high school uh, uh, in the electronic club, we would have uh, coffee every Friday afternoon with cake, 
And in Germany, when you have cake, you have to have whipped cream with it. And it's illegal in Germany to have that whipped cream that comes out of spray cans. So you, you're supposed to whip your own. Uh, of course, we did not have a mixer in the electronics lab, but we had a power drill. And so we attached a little mixy, whirly thing to the power drill and mix our whipping cream with that. It was, but it was the same idea. The service is the rotation, and as long as you can attach it to the, to the attachment point, then it'll rotate anything. So, <clears throat> and it's these kind of services that one wants to produce. It sounds like an abstract thing. I mean, how many times does this happen? But it turns out it happens a surprising amount of time that one can express a computation in fairly general terms and say, I'm willing to total up anything that can be measured. I'm willing to sort anything that can be compared, those kind of things. It really does happen quite often. And so it's handy to have, uh, have that concept of the interface. So the interface means that it, it gives you a way of building tools into which one can plug in different things. So this data set class here is the simplest kind of tool that I could come up with as an example that does some reasonably useful service, you know, computing averages and maxima to anything that, is, that one can plug in into this measurable slot. The plugging in part is easy enough. When a class wishes to be pluggable into this tool, it only needs to do two things. It needs to promise to implement this interface, and it needs to implement this method. That's all. Now, do I want to do this? No. Um, before doing this, I want to go into the, the homework real quick here. Yeah. Well, it's a distribution of labor. So maybe I should show this, um, this diagram really quick. Um, <clears throat> so there's two pieces of logic. There's the logic that is generic. And then how do you find the, the maximum? You know, there's a little algorithm for finding the maximum. You keep looking at things, and you pick the one that is larger than, uh, than the ones that you've seen before. That logic is done in the data set. So the maximum logic happens over here. But the logic as to how to f measure like the value of a coin is done over here. And what the interface gives you is a way of decoupling those two things. It enables the data set to be written without knowing how to measure any specific thing. And so it's, it, the work is done in, in different places, and the job of the interface is to make it possible to disentangle those two, to be able to do useful work with partial information. So <clears throat> um, because it's a little abstract, I've designed this marvelous homework. Um, So I've come up with a grid interface that we want to have a quick look at. And <clears throat> so um, what I want to do is I want to store a grid of numbers, the zeros and ones. I'm really mostly interested in zeros and ones, but they could be any numbers here. I know, but I want to be coy about the way that I store them. Now, you might say, that's silly. Why, why not be clear about the way you store them? Obviously, they should go into a two-dimensional array. But when you look at these guys here, Right now, I've done them so that these things here, they all shoot inward. What if I made them in some other direction? Here, they all seem to annihilate themselves in the middle. But what if I made them so that one of them just goes outwards? And now I want to track the progress of those gliders over a million generations. 
Now, if I wanted to do this in a two-dimensional array, I would come up with a huge array, most of which would be empty. And that's not so good. It would be better if instead of storing mostly zeros, if I could just store the non-zero locations. I might only have a few, because these gliders here, each of them only occupies five spaces, and if I want to find its travel through, through life, you know, I only need to find out where, where it is, and I don't need to specify all of those zeros around there. So even something as simple as a grid, there may be more than one way of specifying a grid. If I have lots of <coughs> non-empty locations, the two-dimensional array is a great way of doing it. If I have mostly empty ones, then there, there's a different way of doing it that's much, much more efficient. And so whenever you're in that kind of situation, then you say, well, what do they have in common? And what they have in common is exactly what I need to make my, my game of life computation working. And think about what I need to do the game, game of life thing. I need to find out which locations are occupied. So I'm going to say anything is entitled to call itself a grid if it can give me at any point a list of all of the occupied locations. And if for any location, it can also tell me what the valid neighboring locations are. And now you can imagine there are different kinds of grids, really. So the grid that we've studied for the last homework, 12b, if I asked it what are the neighboring locations of this fellow, it would have said there this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. But if I use my strategy that I say I'm only going to store the non-zero locations, I can now implement a potentially infinite grid that never ends. So I can say, oh, this grid will go on forever in all directions. And so the valid neighboring locations of here would go into a negative territory. And now if you follow the trip of the glider through this infinite grid, of course, the grid is never really infinite, but I can track it you know, as it gets further and further away from the solar system. <coughs> so, all right, so <coughs> a grid has to be able to tell me what are its valid neighbors. Actually, the computation of the valid neighbors is easier in the infinite grid than in the finite grid because there are no borders to worry about. And of course, a very important thing is I have to be able to get what is at a particular location. Once I know that the location is valid, which I know from the first call, I need to know, be able to find out what is there. And I have to be able to set an arbitrary location. Oops, there's a typo here. Oh, is there? No, no, there's not a typo, no. I have to be able to set any, any valid location with a value. Never mind, it's, it's fine. So, <clears throat> so those are the four things that make a grid for me. Get any location, set any location, give me all the occupied ones and give me the valid ones. And there's any number of grids that you can do in this way. For example, the grid that we're using for the game of life, every cell has eight neighbors. Well, that's the game of life. You could have another grid where you say you're only interested in four neighbors in the four compass directions. And such a grid would work with this interface you know, occupied locations would, would be easy enough to implement. Valid neighbors would now reduce a different set of neighbors. You can have grids, and in fact, there's a mystery grid in, uh, that you're going to see. And I'm, just, I'm telling you what the mystery grid is, although you will not find it enlightening. The mystery grid lives on a donut. And it has cells that live on a donut. And when you rotate around, then you come back to where you were before in either direction. So you know, that's a grid that is certainly different. And you could go to your local donut vendor and see if they have any, any interest in it. So, <clears throat> so that's the interface of a grid. Now notice in this interface here, I have the methods. I say what the methods should do. And I give no implementation. I leave it up to the specific grid on how it wants to implement it. 
And so your job <coughs> is to do that implementation for two different grids. And the first grid is the rectangular grid that has rows and columns. And that's pretty much going to be to take the solution to 11B, or 12B, I'm sorry. Um, and if you haven't solved 12B, you can just look at my solution and, and rearrange it for here. So get and set are surely going to be pretty trivial. Um, <coughs> valid neighbors and occupied locations. You, um, they're, they're in almost the same form, maybe in, even in exactly the same form, I can't remember. And you can just, just fit them right in here. And then you're done with 12, with 13A. 13B, that's the infinite grid. Of course, it's not really infinite. It can only collect a finite number of points at any given time. But it's unbounded. It can get as large as, as one wants. And so to implement an infinite grid, what, or an unbounded grid, I should say, you do the following. You keep two arrays. One array has all the locations. And one of them has all the values. And so you might say, at 1, 2, there was a 1. At 2, 4, there was a 1. At 3, 7, there was a 1. So you just keep those parallel arrays. The first one has location objects. The second one has numbers. Um, I recommend to make them array lists, not arrays, because it's easier to, ma to manipulate. So <clears throat> in this case here, occupied locations is actually trivial to implement. What's occupied locations? It is just this thing. Right? That's occupied locations. Um, valid neighbors is also very easy, but I'll leave that to you because <coughs> it's unbounded. It's always the same computation. You just go into the eight corners. Um, <coughs> you don't have to worry about the border. Now, how do you do get? So let's say we want to do a get of location 2, 4. <coughs> Well, there's really only one way to do it. You have to try to find it in here. And you say, is, is, is it this? No. Is it this? Yes. And then you look at the one here, and that's the one that you return. How do you do set? So let's say we want to set 9.11 to 2. Well, just like what you say is, we just add the location to the locations. We add the value to the values. Except, yeah, what if it's already there? Then I need to override the existing one. And then there's one other fussy case. What if I was asked to set something to 0? Then instead, you need to remove it. Right? That's how you implement set. So notice that the implementation of set is really different when, you, when your underlying array, or uh, grid, I should say, when your underlying grid has this representation, as opposed to when it is an array of rows and columns. But conceptually, they do the same thing. And so that's uh, another way of looking at interfaces, that you have an underlying concept of what these thing, things should be doing. But there may be more than one way of implementing that concept. And so the interface lets you <coughs> encapsulate what's common between the various competing implementations. And then you can just use that in your computation. And in fact, you're going to see that in part C. In, in part C, I'm asking you to implement homework 12B, the, the game of life, and not with a two-dimensional array, but with a grid. And so instead of asking the two-dimensional array, what are the neighbors here, you ask the grid, hey, what are your neighbors? And the kicker is, you will not know which grid I'm going to use to test it. So the tester will swap in a different grid that you've never seen before. You have no idea what it is. Well, how the heck can you do anything if you have no idea what it is? Well, you do know something. 
you know that it has these four methods. So all you get to do is, in 12C, is all you can do is use those four methods and nothing else. So hopefully that will give you a good feel of a pretty useful application, actually, of what interfaces are in a situation <coughs> where, where it really makes sense to use them and where it's a little bit more interesting than that, than that measurable interface. This situation here is what you're going to be spending all your time in 46B about. There's going to be multiple ways of implementing the same data structure. You're going to be working with the interface when you use the data structure. You're going to be working with the implementations of the interface when you construct one of those multiple implementations. All right. So do I want to, uh, if I have time, I'll do this. Um, so a couple of technica technicalities. <coughs> it often happens that you need a, a convert between class and interface types. So the conversion goes as follows. Um, here I have a bank account. Um, and I now want to, normally uh, I want to pass it on to a method. So I want to be able to say data set dot add account. And this is now the parameter here of add. Well, that was a measurable. Remember, it said measurable x. And so the question is, can I go from a bank account to a measurable? And yes, you can. You can always go from an object of a class to a variable of any interface that the class implements. <coughs> All right. Now, you, <coughs> you could uh, convert here from the coins into the same mess. So the same variable mes here can hold an account, and a little later it can hold a coin. As long as it's measurable, it's okay. If it's not measurable, like rectangles are not measurable, well, why are rectangles not measurable? Yeah, the class rectangle doesn't implement the interface measurable. Why doesn't it? Okay, who wrote the class rectangle? Someone at Sun Microsystems. Who wrote the interface measurable? I did. Okay, and the fellow at Sun sadly never heard of me, and so he didn't follow this great idea. So that happens. And um, if, if you're interested in how you could resolve an issue like that, which in practice sometimes is an issue, <coughs> if you read on uh, into sections, what, 9495, it has an alternate way on how you can deal with that issue. But we're not going to do that uh, today. So that's a slide. Sometimes you can't make use of the interface. It, there has to be collaboration between the provider of the interface and those who wish to use it. All right. Um, so here I have a little picture where you can see that the measurable variable, the mes variable, references the same ver uh, object as the account variable. So you have these two variables, and now something uh, interesting happens. Now let me take mes. What method can I call on mes? For sure, I can call get measure. All right? Can I call mes get balance? Yes or no? I heard a timid yes. And since I kept on uh, digging, it must not be the right answer. And I can't. Why not? So put yourself in the shoes of the compiler. What does the compiler know about MES? The compiler does not track what goes in on it. All it knows about it is it has a type, and the type is measurable. All the compiler knows about measurable is it has get measure. It does not know that it has any other method. And in fact, it's good that it doesn't know because, for all you know, in the next second, mes points to a coin, which it perfectly well could, right? It's, I can assign it like that. And now it would be a crime to call get balance on it. A coin does not have a balance. So the only thing that you can do with a mes reference is to call measurable methods on it. Now from the point of view of the data set, that was fine. That was all the data set wanted to know about the world. It just wanted that partial 
view of the world. So, and I don't want to talk about casts. No. So now when we look at Mez one more time, what is the type of this object? What is the type of the blob on the right? Maybe. Could have been coin. It is not measurable because there are no objects whose class is measurable. So I don't actually know what it is. It's, I can't say with certainty whether it's a bank account. It might or might not be. I can't say with certainty whether it's a coin. It might or might not be. But I know for a fact it is not measurable. There are no objects. Why are there no objects of class measurable? Because it's not a class. It's an interface. So it's kind of interesting that you can have variables that are measurable, but you can't have objects that belong to the class measurable because there simply is no such class. So a variable can be a reference to a class or an interface, and an object must always belong to a class. That's what makes an object an object. Yes? Yeah, I know that there was a question on the quiz like that. Uh -huh. But when you're looking at the object through measurables, the only thing we can say about it is that it is a measurable. Granted, you don't yeah. substantiate objects that are measurable. But so, you, so you could say it belongs to a class, an unknown class, that implements the measurable yeah, interface. Measurable. Yes. So if that's one of the right answers, if that's one of the answers, that's fine. But if the, the question, I'm sure, was, was correctly worded and vetted by the lawyers to say, to which class does it belong? Yeah, but it said specifically, <coughs> first of all, it didn't say that you assigned it to measure. Uh -huh, so yeah. it, it missed that part of the question. But it, it seems to me you can speak of it as anything other than measurable if you're looking at it through measurable. Yeah. So, um, so the, the, it, it, <clears throat> the way the wording is that, that, uh, that it can't be an object of measurable. It can't be an instance of measurable because an interface has no instances. But it's an instance of the object. It will understand. That's correct. And so if, it, if, if that was an option in the quiz, that, that would be the one that you should choose. So I don't remember the exact wording of it. So I hope that it was done, done OK. Uh, it might not have been. But so it is an instance of an object, it's an instance of a class that implements measurable. But it's not by itself an instance of measurable. So there won't be a quiz on the final with that. I just wanted to point out that you can have variables whose type is one of these ephemeral things of which there don't actually exist any objects. That simply means it's a variable that can hold one or the other or any of those objects. So the flexibility is you can put in any of those objects, whatever you like, but the, the, the drawback is you can't call any methods on it except those that the, that's in the lowest common denominator in the interface. So there was a question somewhere? All right. So <clears throat> let me see if I have a picture of this. It's a little better. I do. All right, so here's the same picture again. <clears throat> and so there's a final thing that is probably pretty obvious to, uh, to most people who see this, that now you have this, uh, this measurable reference here. It points to something that we don't know what it is. And when we call a method, the only method we can call is get measure, which get measure methods get called? Well, it totally depends. If at this particular point, MES was hooked up to a bank account, it calls bank accounts get measure. If at a particular point, MES was hooked up to a coin, then we call the coins get measure. I mean, how else could it be? This phenomenon has the fancy name polymorphism. And it's very important that you remember that polymorphism is a very important concept. 
that's all that I want you to remember about polymorphism right now. Um, it's if I explain, I could spend 20 minutes explaining it, and afterwards you would know less than you know now. So polymorphism simply means that it calls the right method, and that's all that we want to know about. Uh, and from a point of view of a programmer who's never seen anything else, this is totally obvious. This is how it should be. This is how, of course, it is. You know, of course. And somehow we need to look up what is that object, figure out what is the correct method for it, and then just call it. It turns out to be a little bit tricky to implement, but that's not our uh, business. That's the business of the people who implement the virtual machine. It's not that tricky to implement either. All right, so I do not want to talk any further about polymorphism, except that it is a very, very important concept, and you may well be asked in a job interview what it is. Then you should say Horstman said it's a very important concept. Um, but I do want to just one more time go to the data set and say what's important about interfaces is they give someone the ability to write code that does something useful, that does a useful computation <coughs> without being overly specific about what it is that gets plugged in. And you're going to be doing the exact same thing in homework 12C where you're going to be given a grid object. You don't know what grid it is. It's just some grid. And you're going to be computing this for the next generation. And you're going to be doing that by only knowing it's a grid. Maybe it's uh, a rectangular grid, maybe an unbounded grid. You don't know what. And you're going to be calling some of the methods. There's four methods instead of one. And when you're done, you will have the grid transformed to its next generation, not knowing what grid that is. And, <clears throat> and when you see, it turns out to be a completely straightforward modification of what you had to do in homework 12C, or what someone had to do in homework 12C, because you're able to, to inspect the solution. All right, now let's see if we have a couple of time for at least one clicker question. Yes. Now, this is such a beauty. Okay, well, when you fire up Piazza while I do this. All right, so the question I have over here is, where's my class? Why do I have to come up with this pesky new class? Why can't I just call this object and make object here and object here? What's object, you may ask? Did we talk about object at all? Um, OK, so object is the class that's the lowest common denominator of all classes that exist. Like, <clears throat> you can convert everything into a reference of object. So it's always legal to say object obj equals account, for example. <clears throat> well, um, so I give you four reasons on why that can't work in a, a four potential ones. <coughs> and I want you to pick one. Yeah. Um, well, except, of course, it's Java, so numbers are not, never objects. But string, for example. Yes, it would absolutely work. So 
Um, with my blue J. So if I said object Fred equals would totally work. So I've now just sorted in an object. <coughs> so now Fred contains a rectangle. Yes. Uh, no. Uh, there's a stronger reason than that. And I guess that's the reason that I'm trying to get at with this question. So let's say you did this. Where would it break? So where was I where I had all these objects? Over here. <coughs> so I'm putting object here, putting object here, putting object here. Could I call it? Could I say add of, a, of an account? Sure I can, because it'll take an account and turn it into an object. No sweat there. Now let's go on here and say, sum plus x dot get measure. Will it compile? It can't compile because what is the type of x? It's object. And how is the compiler going to know that this particular object has a get measure method? And so the compiler will say, if it's an object, you can't call any method on it. Well, actually, I lied. There's a couple of methods that you can call an object, such as toString. Every object has a toString method. But not every object has a getMeasure method. So at this point here, it's going to break. So let's see. Ah, this, this was a definitely very ambiguous question. So let's look at the other potential answers and see why they're wrong. <clears throat> because object is a class, not an interface. It's actually you know, not a bad answer because until today and the next lecture, you never had the situation where you could convert one class to another. But as you'll see on Wednesday, there's a couple of other situations when you can do that. So the correct answer was because object doesn't have a get measure method, and that, that's certainly correct. Because our bank account doesn't implement object, well, object is not an interface, it's a class, but as you'll see, uh, on Wednesday, you can convert a bank account or any other class to object nevertheless. And finally, you know, n not many people uh, put paid any attention to this. Yeah, object doesn't have a get balance method, but we never called get balance anywhere, so that doesn't matter. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm not going to do that. You guys can figure that out yourself. All right. Um, that brings me to what I wanted to say about interfaces and polymorphism. So again, the whole point of this was not to give you a, an incredibly deep understanding of what interface and polymorphism are, but to give you hopefully a non-scary introduction that they might be useful. And in combination with the homework, and there's a lab about this, um, <clears throat> that, that you get kind of a feel for what they are. Um, we're not going to pester you with it on the final at, at any great length. But when you're going to see it again in 46b, at that point, the hope is that your mind is ready for it. All right, um, so I'm going to finish with that because I want to uh, hand out the, these evaluations. So could I please have a volunteer who will later do whatever it is that needs to be done? Um, do I hear a volunteer? OK, great, thank you. Um, so I will not be present for this so that I can't influence your opinion in any way. So please fill it out honestly. It, it helps me 
to know what it is that I did right or wrong um, when I teach this course again, which won't be next semester or any time in the near future, I think, but still. So I, I'm, I am interested in what worked for you and what didn't work for you. Um, I'll see you on Wednesday then. Thanks.